Testando, você me ouve, Léo? Testando, testando, tradução simultânea. Tá boa essa distância ou tá muito perto o meu microfone? Tá bom, você tá um pouquinho aqui. Será que meu celular? Põe pra cá. Melhorou? Eu não tô ouvindo chiado nenhum, pra mim tá bom. Fala aí, deixa eu ficar aqui fora, por favor. Tá bom. Alô, tradução simultânea, testando, teste, um, dois, três, essa é a tradução simultânea, aqui é a Paula. Tá boa essa distância? Muito bom dia. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone. In this gray morning, very overcast and chilled morning in the city of São Paulo, we're here gathered with our diversity, with our mix, with our colors, so we can begin the Innova Capital event, which is for an ecosystem for a high impact, social impact and sustainable for Brazil, US. I'd like to thank you everyone for your presence and those who are following us live with our online broadcast. In order to begin our event, I have the honor to invite onto the stage Denise Hills. She's the Sustainability Superintendent, Superintendent and Inclusive Businesses for Unibanco Itaú, 
Bank, and she will be our first speaker for this morning. Well, first and foremost, good morning. It's indeed a great morning, but not what's going to happen here. First, I was just talking to Lidon just now. I have a formal speech here with me, so I don't forget main points. But the first thing that came to my mind, and I mentioned to them, was a quote that I usually say, the future one day gets here, eventually gets here. Because throughout the years, we've been talking about so many things, we've been working on so many things. But because of that fear, is this indeed what we have to do? But so hard to actually get there. So just a reminder, the day we actually get there discussing a, a topic like this, speaking of actions that we're going to promote and foster and scale, is to, remi is to remind, uh, it's a great reminder. In spite of the great, it's a happy day. So I'm very happy to welcome you, welcome you here at home because this is an in-house event. And I truly, indeed, hope that you bring this spirit to the discussions. And I also hope that we are able, through moments like this, to promote a country that represents us in every way. Leno spoke about different colors and sizes, but that should represent us not only as people in a country, but in every way. So I would like to indeed thank everyone and to focus on the relevance of this example, uh, the, the importance and relevance of this topic as in diversity and the ways to understand this. And to know that we can do much, but we're only taking the first steps. And we need to really find ourselves at a learning point, to touch points together and understand what our true contribution is for this true uh, challenge. And thus, we can keep on working. The topic is not new, to the contrary, I would say, but in my personal history with the whole financial system since 1988, that's my experience, I've worked for several banks, but that's the first time in my life that I'm getting closer to a reality where I can actually picture this being part of something that happens from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., meaning my daily life. And I think that is the momentum, meaning... We've been getting great outcomes looking at business and models that are more about mindset, really, models or the a great discovery. With a woman entrepreneurship model that today for small companies in the bank is 35% of all in women and female entrepreneurs, it's 35% of our portfolio. So a different outlook to this with different multilateral entities and outlooks will enable these women to have a business success that is much greater. I'd also say greater inclusion, inclusion and use service products in a more efficient manner because they have better credit scores, believe it or not, better than men generally speaking, and that has to do with no rocket science or business model. It's not rocket science, really. It's our contribution, information, instead of an economy type of speech, but to teach the importance of how to look after a business as well as you look after the soul of your business. That enable women to perform and find their ground in a much seamless manner. And I believe that here, what we are going to discuss throughout the day is much related to this. So indeed, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you and cheer you on for this great opportunity to all of us, really, so that we can, who knows, one, two years, be able to discuss the day we managed to change something and take one further step so that we can leave this with this spirit. So this is the energy of the day. I wish a great day and I hope we, great work today. We're going to be here following and I hope we see get to meet again in colorful days, <laughs> regardless of the weather, from now onwards. Thank you for the opportunity and let's enjoy the event. Thank you, Denise. You spoke from the heart, I could tell. And that's most important, I would say. Thank you very much. Now, 
I've got the pleasure to, to invite onto the stage Mr. Ricardo Zoniga, the General Counsel of the United States for Brazil, for Sao Paulo, pardon me. Thank you very much. And Denise, also thank you for the venue and your commitment with the bank and the whole proposal of the bank, the theme. I think it's absolutely important for this type of commitment, really, for the private initiative, the bank, the financial world. After all, all what we're talking about is exactly this. I've got my notes, but I'm also going to ad lib why it, this matters so much. What we're talking about here, and I really like the name of the event, the U.S. Brazilian Connection, because that's exactly what it is. É isso que realmente nos traz, nos une como experiência, como mas também a nossa realidade. And now I'm going to challenge the interpreters because I'm switching languages all the time. Eu estou desafiando os tradutores, eles já me conhecem. Eu fico trocando de língua. I just want to acknowledge Hugo Flores, Ruth Pinheiro, Riafra uh, Chairperson, and Cornelius, thank you so much. Muito obrigado por ter vindo participar desse evento. É realmente muito importante para todos nós estarmos presentes nessa discussão. I also would like to start by congratulating uh, IEDB by for Innova Capital and the program for supporting Brazilian Afro entrepreneurs and the opportunity and the partnership, really. It is indeed a great satisfaction for the U.S. consulate to be present in this such important event. And precisely that, our two countries share great diversity ethnically, culturally, and socially. And we also share responsibilities to face racial disparities and promote equality of opportunity. After all, diversity is the foundational stone that supports our economy and not its roof. I think it's a very important element so that today, that's why this event is so important, because Brazil, the US, both countries are immense, are huge. But also, we are with different realities in our populations and societies. And the challenge for a country this size is how to capture this energy that we see in the this, in this society and assure opportunity. And in order to find a way to help the entire population, to make their dreams come true and realize their potential, we also have to see the possibilities of the country itself. É isso que realmente que une o Brasil e os Estados Unidos. Eu acredito que qualquer outro fator, essa é a razão pelo que a qual os americanos estão tão à vontade no Brasil. And that's why Brazil, Brazilians are so much in, can, somos sociedades que nos refletem. Somos espelhos um do outro. E o que é forte um do outro, e onde temos os nossos desafios também. Eu acredito também que essa é, é o propósito fundamental da nossa perspectiva, de participar desse evento e do nosso esforço mostrar exatamente isso, que há possibilidades, existe um trabalho real a ser feito, mas há, também já houve muito progresso, progresso em assegurar que diferentes realidades de pessoas na nossa sociedade e suas experiências não são fixadas, ou seja, elas são a realidade que que a gente precisa lidar e trabalhar de toda maneira que a gente puder, porque elas são parte das forças fundamentais do país. E o que separa o Brasil e os Estados Unidos, eu diria, pensando de qualquer outra sociedade comparativamente no mundo, é exatamente isso. É o que realmente, a, a identidade do, de como o nosso povo se sente, resiliência como brasileiros, como americanos, Essa é a nossa realidade. A questão é, como asseguramos que todas as partes de nossa sociedade sintam que eles têm caminhos, maneiras de se tornarem completamente integrados, parte dessas sociedades, no sentido de... Os seus sonhos também são parte desse sonho maior. E é somente realmente num esforço focado da nossa sociedade civil, da parte também 
de instituições como o Itaú, instituições como o BID, instituições como... e governamentais também, que conseguem iluminar o que está sendo feito, o que já foi realizado e o que precisa ser feito. E é uma experiência enriquecedora. And back to Portuguese, challenge to interpreters, and that is why it is worth our while to keep on this work and to keep on doing more further investments in this aspect because it is the future of our country. After all, that's it. We have to find on how to capture this energy in our countries, in our societies, to improve social conditions in our countries. It's a huge challenge. It is a challenge that is going to keep on happening. Most probably we'll never reach the final target objective. It's quite impossible. We're human beings. So it's absolutely important to keep this in energy in this group. That's why I thank you so much for the invite to be part of this. And I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo, for your honest words. And now to welcome on behalf of the Develop Inter-American Development Bank, I would like to pass the floor to Hugo Flores de Moran, the representative of International Development Bank. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The challenge now is going to be greater to to Spaniards because I'm speaking half Portuguese, half English. So if you don't understand me, please let me know. If you don't understand what I'm saying, most certainly I'm speaking Spanish, not Portuguese. No, indeed. Thank you. Thank you for us as IDB. It's a pleasure to be here. It's shared inheritance, I would say, heritage, pardon me, with Innova and IDB and what we've been doing in Brazil and in this region. We truly believe that the future of Latin America is connected to its entrepreneurs, with its innovators. And undoubtedly, a very important aspect is the diversity American Latin ha Latin America has, and undoubtedly Brazil has this diversity. So it's indeed a pleasure to work together, thinking of a future and the present, I would say. And a city like Sao Paulo, not only like Sao Paulo, in terms of innovation, is incredibly dynamic. I've had the opportunity like three weeks ago in the US to attend MIT University gathering of colleges. And I saw the number of innovations MIT and these universities have over there, especially the US as the size of that country. But now I am in Sao Paulo and I noticed there are so many great things, solutions, innovations, socially geared that are very much connected to our connected uh, reality. So IDB. We've got this objective to indeed pay attention to these innovations. And as a development bank, we actually have two very important jobs. One is related to knowledge and the exchange of knowledge. And this type of meeting is exactly for that. This type of gathering is exactly has great important members, Brazil and the US getting together to exchange information, experience on how to be more inclusive. Because that's a challenge for Latin America and specifically Brazil. How can we be even more inclusive, especially when we speak about diversity of all sorts, including gender and ethnicity? I think this is a great opportunity to start thinking about how to design the future. And I would like to thank sincerely, honestly, to Itaú, to the U.S. consulates for this partnership. And we'll have to bet on the e innovation ecosystem. And because the ecosystems need, because they're systems, they involve different sectors. But we have to keep on 
working on our efforts to do it more and more and have more players, more stakeholders. This is the private sector, the entrepreneurs, the public sector also. And I think this is the approach we as a bank have. We are a group, you see. I also want to comment that by the end of this month, we'll be back to Sao Paulo as a group with this idea to work closer to the private si sector, but also to emphasize on how we complement each other's work as a work with the public and the private sector. And as, a, as an ecosystem, we need every single part. We need everyone. Indeed, we have to keep on working. It's, it's joint efforts with all of you. So I thank you for your presence. And undoubtedly, this is going to be very successful. And one, I'm not talking about one, two years, I'm going to talk about now. We will see much more Afro-Brazilians innovating, being entrepreneurs, and changing. And like we say, IDB, improving lives, improved lives of our citizens. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. We thank you, Hugo Flores, for his kind words. Now, Organize an event is always a major challenge. It's not easy to organize an event. Why? Because we may change our minds every second. So like yesterday, we were incredibly tense because we had a number of confirmation that this auditorium would not be enough to host everyone. So we got an extra room so that we can have enough room, enough for all attendees. Uh, and now we have a, a venue here that we have available seats. Most importantly, the people who chose to be present here today most certainly will have a unforgettable experience, I would say. Denise has expressed that herself in her introduction. We design our future by working, by acting now, in the now. The future is the next moment, and that is our possibility. Everybody who's here are multipliers of this, of what's going to happen in today's day. And this is an important aspect, and it has made immense power, regardless of the number of people who actually turned up and the no-shows. We all have a magnificent Magnificent, uh, magnificent potential to multiply and spread, especially when we feel this experience in a sincere manner with our hearts. And this is part of our work purpose and life purpose. Without further ado, I now would like to invite Ruth Pinheiro. Ruth Pinheiro is the chairperson of Riafro the Afro Entrepreneurship Brazil Network. I would like to invite her to the stage so that she can do the first speech, first presentation. Look, the estimated time is five minutes for her. That's the slot. But because the opening was going to take 10, and because we're going to respect emotion more, speak from your heart, speak with your emotion, we will tolerate time over time because we I really want you to express yourself in a way that you are you feel comfortable and happy. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here. After so many years working with empowerment, Afro entrepreneurship and it's been so many years and I'm so happy to have met here wonderful people. So let's talk about Reafro, our entity. Today, I am I'm representing the, the Afro Entrepreneurship Brazil Network. This network was founded in 2015. It's a baby, therefore. It started very, very recently, but with major capitals, really, and actions. It has inherited a number of actions that are being carried out throughout the years. So the Afro Entrepreneurship Network, started out as a project. This project was carried out with Sebrae's support. 
And when it came to its end, the legacy of the project was the net was a network as an institution. And today, it, well, it started with 1,600 registered entrepreneurs. This is the picture you have there with the day of its foundation. Uh, December 13, 2015. But now, the capital of many, the human capital, 1,600 entrepreneurs, 500 validated business plans, great uh, willpower to really get together and work to change reality. Our Afro-Brazilian uh, and Brazilian population reality. And one year I see Judith Morrison, what we call, Ju we kind of call Judy. And one of the actions that drove this movement was in 1995, a first poll taken to learn about Afro entrepreneurship. And the resource came from IAF Bank. And Judith, at the time, she was our main driver for IAF. And that little poll research survey, actually, uh, led to more surveys and polls, and this whole movement generation. So we had Marcelo Paixão always working with this. And then the IIB Institute, together with Santa Catarina University, did an even broader study. And now it's getting deeper and more elaborate. And now I learned about Marcelo Paixão's study on credit. That was the main issue, the main hindrance for most Afro-entrepreneurs. So the network has a number of objectives, but it's basically to foster and encourage Afro-entrepreneurship in Brazil and cooperation as business cooperation for social inclusion and development. So we therefore believe that with entrepreneurship uh, improvement and the improvement of our businesses, we can indeed change reality. Some of the objectives, there are many listed, but here to foster social economical development for Afro entrepreneurs, to promote business opportunities, to put together partnerships for micro and credit programs, foster system and production finance lines. And also we have major concern with encouraging the youth, meaning to really this new generation is living in a new Brazil, different Brazil, and much can be changed indeed. We've managed to to do this with IDB support and the Federal University of Santa Catarina. We together we put together a strategic plan that began in 2016. We just finished now. We have a consultant by IDB who is here. By the way, thank you for your hard work. Who's made us see a reality, a study, what we actually need to keep on moving steadily and strongly, because not quick steps, but steady. The structure of the network is very big. We have a general assembly where all members are sitting. We have a deliberative council that includes the board plus five members representing five different states, but now we have 12 states representation. The one executive board, comprised of five members, the one tax council, and service staff, we call it basically what we call coordinators. They re for coordinates, really. Ad they do admin, general coordination, legal, etc. We will, I would like also to take the opportunity to take the opportunity to thank our general coordinator, Nogueira, there he is, I would like to acknowledge you, our VP, See now where is she? There, waving, and and our dean, his Riafros dean, and Marshall from São Paulo, who is the main driver for São Paulo. Also, Cassia Marin, she coordinates Rio. Thank you so much for your presence too. We're together. I don't see where is he? There, waving. Hello, since Conimar's time we've been together in this struggle so we've been working and in a voluntary manner to do afro entrepreneurship forward so what are the works now 
Riafa, what does it do exactly? And we are in all these states, Amapá, Bahia, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Maranhão, some with more, with more work, more actions, others with less. But I'm going to give you the São Paulo example. São Paulo has been doing actions and training actions in different regions of the state. And this is very important. Other states, like Rio Grande do Sul, for example, Rio de Janeiro, Amapá, and other states have been working. And this work is because is thanks to those five members for local coordination. They really drive Riafra with actions, really. And the Sao Paulo work happened after a decree. So we are truly lobbying the public sector so we have we can push forward the Afro entrepreneurship agenda forward. We have some states, we have a bill currently going through Congress and other states are going through an approval phase so that we can be in a municipality. We can actually have actions to support Afro entrepreneurs. We do need a lot of things, and even yesterday we were talking about this. Our network may not be a virtual network only. It has to be a human network. And that means that we have to humanize the business world. And that is hard work, because sometimes we don't think like that. Now, to carry out our work, many things are needed, such as technological solutions, such as the observatory. This is something that came from the University of Santa Catarina. And this project needs to move further, but to do so, we need more technological solutions. Training and support, we want to come up with a long distance learning system. We need investment funds. That is also something we want to focus on, as well as credit cooperatives. These are some of the goals that we have. We know they are kind of bold, but they are perfectly attainable throughout the years if we work correctly. So what do we want? We are looking for specific investments towards physical structure, technology, and personnel. We want to work in a collaborative economy. We want entrepreneurs to be able to scale their businesses. And this is something they need to grow their businesses. We want to focus on digital marketing and also look at return of investment. So all we currently do is to register entrepreneurs. We come up with talks, lectures, and events in different states of Brazil. And to do so, we count on Webo platform, which allows entrepreneurs to have their own e-commerce. That's how we provide them with trainings so they can build their own virtual stores. And this is a work that has been very successful. I know I'm over my time here, so I want to wrap up the session by telling you that we have several different partners. Sebrae is one of them. They actually helped us move forward along with Instituto Adolfo Bauer. I want to voice my thanks to IDB, who's helping us a lot. Seabra Sao Paulo is one of, the mo one of the oldest institutions. Now, this project is, dates back to 1989 in the state of Rio de Janeiro, with Mr. Colimar, with Seabra Institute, with one Seabra, which is the National Institute, the University of Santa Catarina, who has provided us with support for research. And we are now at an early stage of helping black entrepreneurs. And they are helping us back. So we have this virtual accountancy firm that's called ICON from the state of Rio Grande do Sul that's been helping us a lot, as well as CADON, which is an institution from the black movement that provides us with a space that's where we have our headquarters. 
So this is what Reafro looks like currently. We are still at an early stage, but we are already spread out through 12 different states of Brazil. We're looking for different partnerships. We're trying to gather as many partners as we can so that together we may help this network keep on growing. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of study. We have a lot of work to do. We have great human resources in the institution. And what we want to do is to make this institution more alive, so to speak, so that it becomes a national institution with presence in all the states of Brazil, along with all these different networks that are coming up in Brazil. This is a great thing that's happening in Brazil. Many institutions are coming up. And people are actually looking for us, for help. And it's been difficult because we can't help everyone, but we do try to do so. With that, I want to voice my thanks to all of you for having this opportunity of being here, talking about Ray Afro. Our headquarters is in Rio de Janeiro. Here is our contact info, our telephone number, our website, www.reafro.org. And for those of you who want to register in our institution, you just have to log on into the website. We still do not have an association. This is just an idea we have but you can already register online. We are building this new platform, and this platform will allow us to exchange knowledge among ourselves, among different entrepreneurs. So once again, thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers of this event, Mr. Lennon, thank you. And also you, Judith. Thank you for everything. Professor Marcelo Paixão, thank you for all the work you've been doing. I know I won't live 20 years longer, you know, but I hope that, I don't know, maybe in five years, we may already see a different scenario. I hope in five years, we'll be able to see a different situation because I know we've been growing a lot, but there is a lot of room for growth. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for your talk. You don't know if you're going to live 20 years longer, right? But Denise told us that she expects that in about two years, we are able to build a completely different event from this one, which is our starting point, so we can build a whole new, different reality. And I'm sure our ancestors are very happy today because we are here taking up this space and this is something that is crucial to acknowledge so without further ado it is my honor to call the participants of the first panel on initiatives for businesses with a social impact now to talk about this topic it is my honor to invite to stage the wonderful Miss Luana Marquez Garcia. She's a specialist from IDB and one of the founders of Innova Capital. Good morning, everyone. First and foremost, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank all of those who are listening to us online I want to thank all the speakers. It is truly a great honor to be here with you today and share this great moment. I would also like to go back in time a little and thank Mr. Marco Fujihara, who was one of the first people to come up with this idea, to think on how we could reduce this gap that something that still exists between black entrepreneurs and the Brazilian market. And through these different conversations with him, with Mr. Adilton da Silva from IAB and with Mr. Nogueira 
as well as Professor Elio dos Santos in the state of Bahia, in the northeastern part of Brazil, that's when we could start thinking about what this program would look like in Brazil. Now, in IDP, I want to thank Mr. Hugo Flores, Julius Morrison, and the Chief of the Gender and Diversity Division, which is the division I work at in IDB, Mr. Andrew Morrison, as well as Mr. Ru Luis Haas, who was the previous manager in the Department of Opportunities for Minorities. He was essential when it comes to providing the funds and a solid design for the project. So I owe all of them a lot. I want to thank all of them. IDB has been committed to racial equality for a long time in Latin America. Since 2012, more than $4 billion were spent on projects that impact this promotion of racial equality and social equality. Yesterday, we saw the launch of this business coalition to promote racial and gender equality, along with ethos and cert. And yesterday, we could manage to see how this is something that is already becoming a trend. There were many companies involved, and these companies are truly getting together so that we may strengthen this process. So the goal of my talk here is to give you an introduction on this topic, on who black entrepreneurs are in Brazil. I also want to tell you what Innova Capital is and what our plans are for the future. And I'm sure that along the day, you will have the opportunity of better understanding what the benefits are if we all have a more inclusive system a more inclusive financial system. We'll learn from experiences from the US and we'll see that many projects are being done in the US for minority-owned businesses, which are basically businesses owned by Afro-descendants and Latins. We'll also have a panel on the role of major banks, such as the Brazilian Development Bank and public banks and institutions will be able to elaborate on what type of tools we'll be able to develop so as to include Afro entrepreneurs in the financial market. So let me give you a quick overview. I'm pretty sure all of you know these figures. Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world. We are the eighth most unequal country in the world. When it comes to entrepreneurship, these figures are even worse. This report from PNUG that was launched this month on the Index of Human Development shows that clearly. It shows this great gap that we have, a gap between black and white development in Brazil. Now, this gap is something that is crucial to understand. There are 108 million people, and the UNDP report acknowledges that, just like the UN acknowledged that. Up until 2024, this will be the Afro-descendant decade. Throughout these years, that's when we'll recognize and intensify different development, economical, and social activities for Afro-descendant population. About 200 million Afro-descendants are estimated in Latin America, and more than half of them are in Brazil. Now you can see there are great gaps to bridge. We represent 54% of population, but 75% of the population is poor. 71% are victims of assassinates. We know that our population has grown a lot, but figures 
still do not represent reality. So, who are these black entrepreneurs? We do know that despite of all these inequalities that black people face in Brazil, the number of black people that employs at least one person is higher than the sum of the employers in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay altogether. Meaning that we have over a million people in Brazil in such an industry that employs at a higher rate than any other population in Brazil. And these are the folks I want to focus on. I want to talk about these employers. Something I want to focus on is the increase of the participation of black women in those companies that employ other people. Oh, if compared to other sectors, but women's participation was something that increased a lot throughout the last 10 years. There was also an increase in compensation monthly income is something that grew above average. So compensation of black employers grew about 20% above average. And 10% above average among those who employ more than six people. Still, Racial inequality is there, even among these entrepreneurs. When we compare black and white entrepreneurs, those who hire from one to five people, black people receive about 58% of the compensation that white people receive. So now let me move to a different topic. I want to talk about something that has to do with the title of this event, which is the impact. What is the impact industry? What does it have to do with all of this? This industry has grown a lot worldwide. In Brazil, we have 29 impact investors, about $186 million of assets that can be classified as impact investments. And estimates show that the, the investment that is available for impact industry is something that may account for about $2 billion. Now, what I want to focus on here is the great potential that this impact industry has to change this racial inequality that is out there. We know that the focus on health, education, and financial education is important, but for that to happen, the impact industry needs to play its role and not only impact communities, but also to work on these types of inequality by changing the structure of investments. how these investments may be diversified. And therefore, we have to look for these financial benefits that we receive from the assets and the investments when it comes to mitigating risks. And that has to do with having a diversified portfolio of investments. And that is only available if investors know the reality where they're working on. Now, the great issue we face nowadays, and that happens in the impact industry and in the financial market as a whole, is something that is not very different from the US's situation. We see that, well, and unfortunately, we don't have many data on this. 
we don't know the um, ethnical profile of investors. But we do know, I mean, we have some idea from the management committees, and we know that decision makers on investments are mainly white men who are from the middle ca class or upper middle class. And those who receive these impact investments are usually black, white, black men and women with a low income. So there is a mismatch. This is the concept to use. We can't assume that investors who have this profile, this white man, that is completely different from the borrower's profile. Well, we can't assume that they know what is best for this type of population they're lending money to. That is also something we may question. And in the US, there are studies that show that investors themselves, due to the fact that they do not n know the reality of the sector they want to impact on, they end up perpetuating prejudice. They perpetuate some specific types of beliefs, even though they don't know the reality the reality of the communities where they're acting on. There is a study from Harvard from 2014 that shows that in the US, they carried out some experiments on the speeches. Because we usually wonder, why does this investment not reach entrepreneurs? Well, this study shows that even in the pitches, the presentations, or the talks that introduce those investments. Well, when they are narrated by men, there is a 68 percentage of a higher possibility of being interpreted as a persuasive speech when compared to a speech that was equally narrated by a woman. So we know that prejudice is out there. And programs such as Innova Capital are here to face this prejudice. We want to bring investors closer to the sector that, due to this lack of connection to the networks where they work on, the investment networks and big families that actually owe investments and capital, well, due to all these factors, investors do not know the sector where they're working on. As I said, we don't have much data on capital markets in Brazil, but we know that women represent less than 10% of the investments that are made. So let me tell you a bit about Innova Capital. This is a new program that, well, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, you can see some of the entrepreneurs on this slide. Innova Capital had its first edition last year. We did it with a partnership with Anjos do Brasil, with Endeavor, and Elana is here. In this event, we managed to provide these high potential entrepreneurs the opportunity of being trained. And Endeavor has great trainings with high quality, high quality coaching on pitch and speeches. Maria Hita personally gave her talk and her training to these entrepreneurs, and we could see this great difference, this great improvement on entrepreneurs. If you provide them with the correct opportunity, if you give them the focus they need, we see how we can fast track their evolution. So we decided to change that belief that said that black entrepreneurs were not productive just had this need of survival. This is a concept I really don't like. 
Entrepreneurs need opportunities. All of them need an opportunity. And I think some concepts just tear us apart. They separate us. I truly believe that any startup company, any entrepreneur who has human talent may have the opportunity to growth. We just have to invest on them. And that's how Innova Capital started. We identified 1,500 entrepreneurs who went through Sebrae trainings. Sebrae is an institution that has been one of our great partners. Mr. Tiago from Sebrae and Tobias is also here on the audience. And due to this partnership, we managed to have this initial database. Because you guys, you all know how difficult it is for us to find entrepreneurs who have this high potential of growth. We have to be truly embedded with civil society because they're the ones who know who talented entrepreneurs are. So out of this partnership, along with Endeavor with Angels and with IDB committee, we could identify 30 high potential entrepreneurs. If you go to Innova's website, you will see each and every one of them. There are videos on YouTube, on Twitter. You may get to know their story. More than half of these entrepreneurs are women. Their average income, I mean, the foresee what we foresee because we think that out of this, all these companies, 90% of them will become real companies. So the average income will be about $400,000 a year in the first years of operation. 53% of them work with services, 17% in technology, and 30% of them develop new products. If you want to know more, you can see our website. Now, 43% of these companies were in the state of Sao Paulo. So although the project is spread through nine different states, a great deal of them is located in Sao Paulo. This project ended up to be a business competition that was organized by Anjos do Brasil Institution. There was this jury that came from the market. Because we truly wanted to know what the market thinks about these entrepreneurs' ideas. And what we heard from Anjos do Brasil Institution was truly what we were initially thinking, what I personally expected. I mean, these entrepreneurs, they can compete with any business pitch. Why do we not see these people out there? Well, we had to organize a specific competition for these folks to provide them with an opportunity for them to be able to give their talk, give their pitch, and show their work to the market. I think we have to think of all this and what it represents. Now, this is a picture of the closing event. And to wrap up the session, I want to tell you that this process is something that is still ongoing. We are looking for new partners for new additions. Innova Capital is an acceleration program for Brazilian entrepreneurs that are connected to civil society so as to identify what types of businesses and entrepreneurships are innovative. We want to strengthen entrepreneurs' networks, come up with partnerships with accelerators, incubators, develop new models of incubation, and also to come up with financial and non-financial tools for this sector, because we all know that we cannot accelerate a company without having capital, and we just can't have capital without having the correct pipeline for this project. All of this has to go about together. With that, I would like to wish you all a great event. Thank you all for being here today. It is such a beautiful day. It's a pity some people can't, couldn't be here today. And I want to tell you that if you are an investor and you are interested in collaborating, if you want to be our partner, we are open to dialogues. If you want, as an investor or as an entrepreneur, to connect with us, 
please go to our website, register in there, and let's move forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Luana. The website address is www.innovacapital.net.br. Now, it's my pleasure and honor to invite Marcelo Paixão, professor from Austin, Texas, who will have an average of 30 minutes to tell us a bit about the results of a very recent research he carried out. I'm sure there will be very important data for everybody. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can I I'm Marcel Bachon. I teach in Austin, Tex at the University of Austin, Texas. I also am a professor at UFRG, at the Economy Institute, for nearly 20 years. And I've been trying to produce throughout my academic, academic life and professional life a dialogue, a discussion, a true debate about racial equality and the uh, economical theory, because I know of the importance, and I know because of our audience that we have here today before me. I know many have a degree, and I know from the academia can be totally isolated from a matter language that very people, few people have access to, that that's where theory and people training is uh, happens de uh, able to deal with issues like this. So when we talk about inequality in Brazil, a racial inequality we have is a racial democracy and we have a consensus that we have a racial democracy and it's a very elegant manner to create an invisibility in Brazil, in the Brazilian society. That's why it's so easy to work with this theme because basically, we hardly ever see, when we talk about Brazilian realities of Afro-descendants, we won't be innovating. That's why I'm here bringing you the results of a study. You've got the summary right at the door. This research was developed uh, that IDB actually invited officer from Bike Bannon. He invited me to come and develop this dialogue with two people from research, Maluana, Marcus, and Morrison, and other colleagues who have contributed to the development of this study. The study approaches the entrepreneurs' access, people of Afro descendants for business credit. So this study, I'm going to show you several considerations because I'm not very organized when I am. He says, speak with your soul and really with emotion, enthusiastically. So my last name is Passion. So obviously, I'm a passionate person, and I speak. So most probably, I will get lost in my speech. Because of my audience, I better not get lost. So I am going to try and be a bit more organized. So here's my presentation. I really hope I stick to the time allocated to me. I just want to first and foremost deal with the theor theor uh, theory points. Yesterday, I was speaking to some colleague colleagues to have dinner. Le there, I gave a very small presentation about the study. And one of the main teachings that I have personally taken and that I believe and that is my hope that this type of teaching, hopefully it will be passed on forward, it was when I was obliged to deal with a topic about racial inequality, about something that we could, in a generic manner, called economical laws. Economic laws is a term, look, I'm not going to go back to microeconomy guidelines or introductory economic guidelines. These are laws that guide principles for decision making when we are dealing with financial topics, especially the cost-benefit relation. 
that will govern the financial stakeholder at every point. It can be anyone, can be a grower, can be a consumer, an investor. And when we evaluate the financial system, we know there is discrimination in the financial system. And when I tell you this, I say this very clearly because I know the spinning door, the revolving door, as a main obstacle for black population to a bank venue of banking facilities. And I say this very clearly, if it is around hyperbole, it is acknowledged. Everybody knows of Afro-descendants, knows about this reality, about the revolving doors at banks. And we know the financial system has is not very inviting of poor people or black people whose social status is a bit better, is still inside their premises. They are not very well invited. Anyhow, beyond this, we have the more economic macro scenario that is part of the law, the financial logic that is not Brazilian per se of any financial system of how to work. Financial lines, clients are working in a symmetric manner, meaning how capable they are able and what is their net worth to pay their loans and credit lines. So prices and price products will all depend and interest rates will be will depend on a very economic variable that is indeed discrimination. And it's not an accusation. It is how it works in the whole world for everyone, some with higher or lower levels, uh, but this is a reality. So these days, uh, with the average interest rates according to set size class sets, it was part of the financial reports. And here we have the interest rate charged for working capital for different classes, social classes, as per their establishment, how set, as in production levels, and work levels. And here we see the discrepancy, the, what we call micro and bigger entrepreneurs and the differences we see. Here we see 30% difference, depending on how, on the, how long the credit line takes. And this is a very practical and objective example on how the finance system indeed deals with different classes and in an inequality manner, in equal, in e an equal manner. So this is the first point that needs to be taken into consideration when we think about credit systems. And when we think of policies for racial inequality and financial inclusion, especially in this area, we need to take into consideration this first aspect, economic nature aspect, I mean. Second point that I think is incredibly important when we think of credit system regards in economy information asymmetry. That's the credit term. So this process is something, listen, I won't have time to elaborate further of what, it, what information asymmetry means, but in short, there is a lot of information available that deals with the financial system everywhere that deals with the difficulties there are with the creditors and loaners. What type of difficulties they have when a credit contract can be set, can be done. So there you have the two variables, evalu credit evaluation that does a scoring for all prospects that what we call a moral risk and moral hazard. And usually the with adverse and moral uh, hazard points and how they are cross-evaluated depend on the economic status of everybody who is actually doing the loan. So speaking in a more synthesized manner, the less net worth collateral some, uh, uh, someone wants or can provide higher will be the rate that risk will be, meaning the risk of violation will score higher because they don't have that much net worth and that can also impact the interest rate that will be paid. So there's a direct relation between risk and return. The higher risk of the investment, the highest the risk of 
return demanded for carrying out an investment, especially for a credit um, transaction. So you see, this is a translation of a dialogue that is directly connected. And it's true. When it comes to a credit operation, there are risk evaluations that in s at some measures that set from net worth assurance and assets f uh, that can be submitted. There are instances where these difficulties that you cannot really come across as reliable because reliability, that's what financial systems are looking for. What we see is a chronic absence of ability to access credit lines. And that's what we call credit reasoning. If we are not, if you are reckless enough to take on any interest rate that I impose to you to get credit, you are as reckless that you are not a reliable agent. Therefore, that creates a situation that, lead, that leads millions of people to be chronically moved up away from the credit system of any country, really. Here, I don't want to cover the old countries in the world, but I want to remind you of the book, actually the piece nomad by Mohamed Jung, the poor people banker that deals exactly with that. The idea that the world develops the credit principle, the solidarity collateral credit bank lines, that it's a way means to have people to access to have credits through alternative mechanisms. So what type of assurance and collateral you can submit to financial institutions? Now, in the end of my presentation, I'll have some comments and observations about additional about this particular point. But anyhow, we know this issue. Lack of credit access can involve thousands, maybe millions of people throughout the world, including Brazil. And it's also the fact that must be highlighted that if we analyze what, what this capitalist development system was, especially in the US, that gives us access of how our an economic system can be dynamic and inclusive, we can somehow translate the development bank as the universalization of credit function. What is there for first state? War, mass consumption policies, and the universalization of credit for consumption and for house acquisition, school, and other consumption, and open your business included. So when we talk about credit policies, when we talk about financial exclusion, we're not just talking about social exclusion. This is not just about a technique to mit mitigate poverty. No, this goes beyond development models that has the ability to be part of production, ability to be part of the consumption mar consuming market, and how revenue in the end is actually income is distributed. So the social effects that we, s we read from a more restrictive outlook should also be read in a more comprehensive, ample scale in a more system systematic dimension. So these are the economical dimensions, the general overview. When we talk, when in the, right in the beginning I was saying, what is interesting about this study work that enables us to see the economical theory and the racial economic relations. When we run studies about racial inequality, they all fundamented with the sociological, anthropological order. However, individual relates to others. What is the identity construction and the generate dynamics, dynamics is, is so on and so forth. And there's an important dimension, the economic aspect. How the, the rational economic a agent re interacts with discrimination. So we know the credit system impacts economically. And the question linger is, does it also discriminate racially or is only financially? Because the logic would be that behind there should be also a nature there with racial uh, discrimination because the economic agents are connected to the financial history. We will identify, especially in the US, studies when we review the literature done, how it's actually a literature that is reasonably comprehensive. We see in the US academia and then the British academia as well that shows exactly that, that credit can be rationed and embedded in a 
racial or gender. So here I use the stereotype, stereotype which is an uh, unaware action or prejudice as a conscious action. But whatever credit is, and if you are conscious or unconscious, is about discrimination geared towards race. In what way? I look at two providers with uh, providers eligible candidates, and I can do the cross revelation if and learn if gender as a variable can explain in a determined manner the outlook, the the result on that resource. Is that because it was denied and rejected, or the amount requested was greater? I can check all the variables and see what is relevant in my outcomes. And what this literature shows is that indeed you will have stats control, appropriate methodology, so you can analyze this type of reality, and you will check, you will validate that for women, commonly, typically we see the glass ceiling effect. What is glass ceiling? Me, women uh, apply for F lower amounts, and that is related to expect uh, a success expectation from banks. And also, what would be the Afro-descendant uh, entrepreneurs? Even if there are social, financial, similar uh, status to the a non to a white, they have higher rejection rates when it comes to loan requests, and that is directly connected. And you can ask a question: Why? Well, the information asymmetry problem, and now speaking in a more synthesized manner, relates to the fact that a microeconomic decision can be very irrational from a systemic uh, point of view. It can be very rational when we analyze in an enterprise. So if I think, and if I have any reason to believe that a certain uh, reason that the other that the eligible candidate can lose this money. I will not loan because he can lose that money because his credit history is bad, meaning because the candidate has a crazy proposal or because he has certain socioeconomic features or because that person has some features that I can call social culture features. Maybe it's reasonable to say racial discrimination in, a, in different words. It will make me that to lend this resource would be too risky. So these enterprises would make this risk, would consider this risk higher. And what in literature we call the, and it's a professor talking, so it is about uh, statistics profile discrimination, meaning racial discrimination within the economic theory would be means as information asymmetry, meaning I don't know this person. Therefore, this person is before me for the first time with a proposal, but this person is black, is Latin, is a woman. It has some social economic feature that makes this person liable to be identified as I think as a predominant feature of that particular group. Therefore, every individual will be judged as I evaluate the group. So it won't be higher, this particular person will not be acknowledged. It won't have their demands met, and that affect and impact different markets. If you have any curiosity about to learn more about this, I can send you more literature reference and books on the topic. But this is part of our, our archive. Here I have a dissertation that was part of a USRJ PhD thesis. The argument is that 4.8% black or colored people and 5.3% white people used credit and 11.7% of black employers and 4.1% of white employers used credit lines. That means that I'm getting closer to the res data research and I'm and I won't obviously speak about 150 page in such a short time but I'm just going to give you some key data points that I think most relevant to you, but then I'll end my speech talking about public policies and how they create. So these data points show that the banking rates and the financial problem inclusion in Brazil is general, meaning is for the whole of the Brazil, 
but it's much more serious to those entrepreneurs who are non-white. So the study that was carried out dial uh, ha corroborates with the empirical side of the other study I mentioned, especially the EFINCI data. If you don't know about EFINCI, is the Urban Informal Economy Study. The last report was 2003, so a long time ago, but still, it goes to show that audience profile. And our study was carried out from a random, a random survey that showed 1,000 individual micro-entrepreneurs, what we call May in Brazil, for those who don't know, May is a micro-entrepreneur, meaning the group of entrepreneurs who have common social, uh, specific social economic features, and they can have access to a different type of tax set and also social security, uh, differentiated social, dif uh, social securities. And they are self-employees that has 130,000 revenue per year. And we use, again, Sebrae, as I before mentioned. Sebrae gave us access to see the register in two different states in Brazil where the study was conducted. And there, the field research has plenty of data, and you can have more information here on our slide. On our slide. Data points coherently calculates the data we've extracted. Of course, it won't be the same as in Sintra because the, the territory covered for the analysis were different. But the interviews, only 4.3 were declared to frequently use credit lines, and only 19.5% states that eventually do so. So three-fourths of the sample population do not have access or pursue access to productive or work uh, credit, which is quite co coherent to the previous international study and to our most elementary common sense understanding that is part of our conversation here, too. The average amount requ uh, requested for the credit for these financial institutes, formal and informal. Here I've excluded informal, meaning any, uh, any type of brokerage or any resource that you get from family members or friends, even though they exist, not uh, shark, not sharks and brokers of the sort, but they do give access to credit, not as it should as it should be understood, but they were taken out of concern. So the average, uh, it was 7.3, coherence to this type of, with the previous information. And here you can start checking and validating some asymmetries, connecting what I was saying before, the glass ceiling, the expectations, etc. Especially when you read on our slides that the average amounts requested by the white entrepreneurs was 10.7 thousand, 7, 8.5%, and 93% is the average by colored. So we see different expectations of service in the financial service. And in, when you think of average, the amounts demanded by whites vis-a-vis -vis the black were kept the same, 78.5%, but the average white, non-white and blacks were the same. Here we see the results of our research. Here we see 63% recognize that were successful in having access to the credit requested. 9% said they had part of the credits requested, and 20% had full rejection with the credit. So that can be rated as something rationed. By the end of my talk, uh, I will connect the, the docs. I just want to get off the track now. But the colored maize have the non-whites we have 67%, the whites 6 to 2.7%, and the blacks 50%, meaning half declared to not have access, meaning rationed credit. They knocked on the bank's door and they didn't, didn't get the credit. This situation was experienced, so the credit uh, rationing were more real for the blacks. The average credit for the banks, for the all micro-entrepreneurs was 6,000, and the other 
the white Micro entrepreneurs had 9.7, the non color 4.7, and blacks 3.9 things. And I'm talking about white, non white, and black. I know I'm talking about very fast because I have much cover, but these are the words, the terminology that IBJ used. Actually, they used, instead of non white, they used the word colored or people of color. Later, we can go further on this topic. Here we have the average amounts, the inequality between not people of color and whites. Because you see, the average amounts cleared were 3,000 to whites. Sorry. Whites and people of color, 3,000 and 2,000 to blacks in comparison. So the differences are quite clear. When data are compared, data points are compared with the amount requested and the amount cleared, we checked um, an average of 82.1 percent. The ra the ratio with the whites is 90 percent, people of color 85.3 percent, and blacks 65 percent. Therefore, within this data points, to try and set some ideas from all this is that people of color in comparison to the white, they pursue resources whose profile, at least in average, are very close. But when we analyze in terms of what was actually the levels of success, all whites have reached more success. But when we moved straight, move from people of color and go straight to black, we saw a lot of incoherence with the amount requested and the, today, the rates the number of rates, the credits approved, and the interest rates, and the credit rationing that presented higher levels. On the other hand, we see that some indicators, the average indicators for credit access with white and people of color were close. But when you analyze the interest rate, meaning how much did you pay for that loan, interest rate rise, we noticed that that the colored paid about 60% more than whites. That means that if we're going to look deeper into the literature, what it means, I pay more interest rate when my evaluation score is lower. That means this is uh, the relation is there. And finally, Everyone, all re survey respondents, 21% 21% had not pursued credit even though they needed. They declared they needed for consolidating their activities. That's when we call, that's what we name the unencouraged uh, pursuers of credit, meaning this percentage here between whites and non-whites were close, but the blacks, the discrepancy, disencouragement increased by 28 points. And what does that mean? The person needs that resource. They know it could help them to leverage their economic activities, but nevertheless, for some reason, it can be because they are conservative in profile wise or with restriction uh, profiles, especially when it comes to credit evaluators like Serasa for some reason they end up not pursuing this type of credit line and for us for us this was a very important point when it comes to public policy development finally we have some stats control on some data points especially about this particular one why don't people pursue this type of resource and what we understood was who had the best probability to not pursue credit, uh, credit even though they need. So this is an issue that amongst other variables affected directly those who had finished high school, meaning if you are dropped, uh, high school dropout, you know that you have a lesser probability to get an entity to lend um, capital for developing activities. Personal income also plays a major part and coherent part because the major, the more is my income, the more my ability to understand the bank can offer me a loan. Going back to Rio, this is our control group for a re regional variable. Salvador would mean more of a trend to not looking for resources even though they need one. And the final factor is the black. When you look at the data set that is being presented, the black um, entrepreneurs and candidates presented much lower 
I don't want to use euphemism, manager, but they they're more timid, so to speak, when it comes to knocking on doors of financial institutions, and it's um, shy. Aspect comes from this aspect of being this timid is innate, I would say, because there are social factors, racial factors that lead for you to a more timid actions and bringing to this type of differences. Now, in order to conclude my presentation, I would like to highlight these data points here. When you think of all the data sets, white, black, non-white, most evaluated that credit access, especially for work, were hard or very hard. That's how they rated. Less than one third of our respondents showed their access easy. That's how they rated. Now, what we go to race and color, it becomes even more coherent that whites, though they said it was not easy, over half had access amongst non whites, 55%, and amongst blacks, 60%. So we see the vast majority of people do not look for this type of environment because they see this type of environment as a very, not very inviting to receive micro entrepreneurs of color. And the color is indeed a variable and undoubtedly a variable. Final consideration, blacks vis-a-vis -vis white and non-colored declared more difficult to have financial credit. Blacks Whites and non-color have better access. Non-whites and blacks have more pay more interest rate too. In terms of public policies, Luana just spoke here and she gave a, and she put forward a wonderful avant-garde innovative proposal. And in our study was carried out before her initiative by Innova Capital. And here we've seen the challenge to have some public policy elements. We have several, but still, just want to highlight two that I. it seems to me that are quite visible and, put, and has great potential. The first one would be to evaluate, because since mid last decade, we have had microcredit development, the geared one, geared to production, so very intelligent for financial institutions side because they can send resources to micro entrepreneurs or economic agents that are that have less social economic viabilities because they can make more reasonable decisions, more rational decisions. And we at the same time they see a whole literature talking about the difficulties of the Afro um, entrepreneurs to manage their business because of social economic reasons, but also uh, related to prejudice that can come from the consumer side, that can come from supplier side, that can come from the credit system. There is a whole body of study that deals with this, especially in a qualitative manner. So from the data point that we've extracted from this study, we have verified the possibility and we suggest the possibility that Credit setting should work micro credit geared towards production, taking into consideration the reality of groups that historically are discriminated, discriminated against. And they are present in the development of the economic activity. So you see, if on one hand it's incredibly intelligent to have micro credit product, uh, geared towards productivity, it would have been more intelligent if it acknowledges specific realities of certain groups and deals with the treatment in terms of credit of measures, are measures that I won't have time to elaborate further. The other topic that is quite interesting, and here I'm talking directly with Green Bank from UNOS, even though I know Bangladesh's reality is very diff different from Brazilian's reality, even if you compare the sites where socioeconomic are more precarious, meaning still, the two sites, for cultural, religion reasons, are very different. But I am here speaking to this type of uh, initiative because when a proponent, when an author, when a social entrepreneur of that initiative, they work with solidarity credit lines. Because solidarity credit lines, from the point of view, economic point of view, would help entrepreneurs to tackle what we say the collateral curse or the guarantee curse. Groups that are chronically excluded, they become even more chronically excluded 
because they have no collateral to offer banks, therefore no access to credit. So this the collateral solidarity is when a group comes together, they can be creditors, they can be collateral agents to each other. But it's not an economic movement only that move, that drive this type of initiatives. No, what's at stake is also the comp the putting together of what we see internationally that I see lacking when analyze the Brazilian side. Social capital access, relationship access, how to set solidarity between agent stakeholders that goes beyond the uh, training and education or the preparation for anything that would oblige agents, economic agents to have partnership formation in real time where economic interests are put together. You gotta pay for yourself alone, for example. That is a means to do capital development associated to a specific microcredit proposal geared towards historic groups historically discriminated against could therefore generate some very important structuring initiatives, not only in an Afro-Brazilian community, not only because of its economical side, but also when we think of the social aspects and all organizational aspects. So you see there are other proposals, easy to identify, the central bank itself in if inclusion financial report can do it. We, me, a professor, can also do it. There's so many gaps that the financial gaps has to assure full populational financial inclusion. It wouldn't be hard to find several other proposals. We see them throughout different studies. And I'm sure IDB will timely divulge to you in full manner. In closing, indeed, I'm wrapping. Final point. I have to acknowledge Luisa Bairros. She was such an important piece. Luisa, indeed, I remember some conversations, how excited I was. I was concluding my study, finally, truly, a bunch of data points. I'm, I'm really getting to it. I remember Luisa so well, and I got very emotional to remember her. In a way, I, she is here with us. I don't know if in spirit, but in my memory at least. And I'd like to acknowledge and I hope from this type of study, we can coordinate something that is so important that is about public policy, where especially when we speak of Afro entrepreneurship and we knew no credit, it's central element in this policy. And again, there is no capitalism without credit. Maybe, I can use some historical uh, mention reference. It all comes from Florence Venice bankers when they first set up the social capital and trust with credit concessions. So maybe there is some coherence, organic coherence about things. And to truly know that we won't have inclusion racial economically unless we do something very strong towards access to resor resource access and credit res access. I know Innova Capital has wonderful proposal now working in a terrain that indeed dialogues, but not necessarily the same thing, but it, had it is coherent and corroborates. But obviously, I have to be a bit biased. I need to talk about academia planning, the importance of training and education at university and truly training people to towards this. If we want to indeed want to go to an admin, business, economic, accountability, courses and uni um, at universities, we need a number of subject matters geared toward this. We see still very few, and, I, and that is precisely why it is part of my academic agenda for the next year, years in Austin, Texas, to develop subject matters geared specifically to this topic for cooperativism too, and other issues too that I never mentioned here before, in this, not in this presentation at least. But still, I think they are part of a strategy, especially because our future is very important. It will be a major uh, factor to help the critical mass available for dealing this type of thing. 
So thank you very much for... I am open to dialogue if you have any comments or questions. Muito obrigado, Marcelo. Bom, thank you, Marcelo. We're one hour behind. We're an hour late for reasons you know very well. So the next speakers, please keep to your time. If you can actually make it shorter so we can, because we're pressed for time, because I really want to cover everything we have. So without further ado, I would like to invite the second panel. An environment for mechanisms, construction, for growth of small businesses. Our first guest speaker is Mr. Eugene Cornelius, Jr. He is a deputy associated admin for the Administration International Office of Trade for Small Companies, SBA in the USA. Eugene, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It is. Uh, I want to Muito. first acknowledge uh, the International Development Bank for having this. This is right on time and right schedule. And thank you so much for inviting me to come here. This is awesome. And I want to thank my um, counterpart in, in the Brazilian U representing the United States, Ricardo. Thank you for being here and you go for the invite. This is awesome. And I have to say that I am very glad that I went after the professor. <laughs> Because the professor hit on something that you're going to hear from me. Um, the United States formed our organization based on public policy, addressing the very issues that the professor talked about. But also, some of the products and services you're going to hear in my speech are geared toward reaching underserved communities, particularly the African-American community in the United States, and making sure that we had products and loans and microloans in that area for people who did not have collateral, who did have the clarity disparity, who were fearful of coming to financial institutions and governments as well. So I thought it was very timely that uh, my project came right after you. So in 1953, the United States Congress created our agency, and our agency is the Small Business Administration, and our goal and responsibility really is to, I want to make sure I'm doing this correctly, is to look at all the economies across the United States, all 50 states and U.S. territories, and to make sure that we are creating small businesses. But the mission of SBA is not to create small business, it's to create jobs. But we know that small businesses create the best jobs and sustainable jobs and higher paying jobs. So it is very important that you are having this conversation after your uh, economic downturn in Brazil that you are focused on small and medium-sized enterprises because that is where sustainability in the GDP is going to occur. That is where inclusion is going to occur. We know in SBA that two-thirds of the net jobs that were created in the five years post-2007 uh, recession in the United States were created by entrepreneurs, small business entrepreneurs. And the number one growing entrepreneur is African-American women. We also know that people tend to hire people who look, act, walk, talk, and are culturally identified with them. So the more inclusive you are in your expansion of your entrepreneurial pool, the more likely you are to reduce issues such as unemployment, decrease crime, increase education, and expand the disposable income in economic regions of your country. There, SBA does this by what we call the three C's and the D. The three C's are contracting, 
counseling, and capital. I'm going to expand on capital when we get there, but I'm going to touch on the first two. Contracting, the federal government uses its clout as the number one buyer in the United States. We spend over $500 billion a year in products and services. And because we spend that, we make sure that 26, I'm sorry, 23% go, of that spend goes to small enterprises. Not minority enterprises, but small enterprises. But small enterprises are included and minority enterprises are included in that. That 23% that I spoke here is broke down in these numbers. And I want to make sure that you look at how it supports our system. We look at our women's business centers and we have a 5% um, goal in order to reach, to make sure that we are reaching women and making sure that they are buying from the federal government. And we have a 25% go in federal contracts for small businesses and contracting and, and how many jobs are created out of that. Over half a million jobs are created in that situation. We also look at our veterans, people who have served in our military. And we make sure that, it, especially if they were harmed or hurt in, those, in, it, in the military, that they have a fair shot in some of these contracts and agreements. And where you look at the bottom where it says disadvantaged business, small disadvantaged business, that's the cold word for United States to say socially disadvantaged or minority. Or as the, pre as the good professor said, those who are discriminated against. That is the group that we make sure that we create a position for. Now, in this contracting, we have an extra step and it is called our 8A program. And when we look at socially disadvantaged people, the, the minorities people, we are talking about people of color, as you heard the professor refer to, not just African-Americans, but people of color. That means Latinos, uh, Asian-Americans, and Native Americans, uh, uh, as well as African-Americans. We have a program, a nine-year program, that we take that entrepreneur and we create the, a business development program for them. We take them through nine years where we develop, counsel, train, and execute them into a market so that they could be a sustainable business after that nine years. But one of the benefits of that program, in addition to the counseling, training, and mentoring, and all that we do, is that we set aside contracts in that $500 billion that I spoke about that the government spend that only they can compete against. No one else can compete against. And they go for that up to $10.5 million in contracts that they can have. Now, having said that, if there is a unique contract that we are making and we want to make sure that that African-American company gets that experience and exposure, we can so source to that company. We, if we feel we have developed that company, we have taught the business acumen in that company, we have all looked at how that company can produce, we can take the risk and give that contract, if it's 3.5 million US dollars downward to that company and give them the experience in doing that. Once they have that experience, they have what we call preconditioned experience, they can go for bids without, throughout the federal government, whatever having to be in this program. So it is a kind of a entrepreneurship uh, apprenticeship for those small businesses in those socially disadvantaged be. Because we know that when we put them in the marketplace with the larger medium-sized businesses or non-minority businesses, they will not have the competitive edge. So we are 
con we're developing a competitive edge within a controlled environment so that we can expand them outward and they compete on our level playing field. And that is the point of that. Now, during that program and outside of that program, we provide counseling and training. And that counseling and training is done by a wealth of, of, the, of organizations. And it is important, I don't know if I could walk away from the mic, but it is important that you know that there are certain characteristics, certain culture sensitivities that you have to be avail, available, avail yourself to when you're dealing with minority communities and with women communities. So FBA doesn't have this one can fit all training counseling programs. We have developed different programs. We have developed voc um, veteran programs. We have developed women programs. Women have different prejudices and different stereotypes in the United States than minorities may have. And then we have our um, SCORE, our Service Corps of Retired Executives. These are people who have been in business, have done business, and they are the mentors, they are the counselors, they are the one-on-one -on -one trainers to companies who are trying to do the businesses that they already have experience in. So let's say you are going into IT. We will find an IT expert, someone who has done that business, who has retired and, dis and sold his business or whatever, and we will put him with all the young entrepreneurs in that gender or in that industry, and we will work with them. We also have the community development centers, the certified community development centers. And these are really for people who are really not only necessarily minority uh, socially disadvantaged, but maybe financially disadvantaged because we do have in the United States a, a, a small but growing middle class African American community, but we also have a sh extremely profitable level in African American communities. And, and so we know that their needs are a little different than those who may have a little more luxury of financial net. So let's talk about capital. What you heard from the professor was profound, and it, it and his research is right on target. I mean, I can't wait to get that report. It is awesome. What we know is that there is inherited prejudice in the financial world, and anybody who doesn't know that, um, we need to talk. <laughs> okay, uh, it is it is prevalent. And we also know that when you are talking about minority community and women communities, you are talking to people who may not have the collateral. The woman who is venturing out on her own, who may not have the financial structure behind her, who may be a victim of divorce, or may be dealing with something that doesn't have that. How do you protect her? How do you protect the African-American woman, which is the number one growing business in the United States? How do we make sure that she's sustainable and she has access to capital? Well, the government does two things. You, the United States Small Businesses says, we work with seven, over 7,500 banks in the United States. And we say to these banks, you will lend to her, you will lend to her, and we will pull the, put the full faith and credit of the United States government behind that. If you lend to her, we will guarantee 75% of whatever you loan to her. In some cases, 85%. And if she is dealing or that minority is dealing internationally, we will go up to 90% of the loan. If we think that she or he is going to be able to do this and that you are going to, even though we would never say that, discriminate against them and not make that loan, we will encourage you to make that loan. We will, pull, we will say your risk will be 
10% to 15% and not 100% because the United States government believes that this person will succeed and you should make access to that capital. Now, why would the United States government say that? Why would we take that risk? And there's several reasons, but here's the number one reason. We would look at the entrepreneur and we would look at that entrepreneur's vision, his or her business plan. We would look at the ability for them to replay that. Is this a, a marketable enterprise? Is this, does this enterprise have profitability? And even though he or she may lack the technical experience of the underwriting that the bank may require, or he or she may not have the collateral that the bank may have, or the bank is not used to this new industry or this new market, or she or he is in a community where the bank thinks that these people don't have the disposable income to buy the product or service. All these things that you kind of heard twangled into the research of the professor, we have taken into account and said, let's void them out. Let's make it a level playing field and we will back this. We will take the risk because we believe this is doable and it can happen. And that's on the product or service that the entrepreneur has. Now, that's our 7A program. <laughs> Under our 504 program, we say, wait a minute. I We saw, when I was in uh, Salvador yesterday, we saw a young man get off the bus and, and he was going to the beach. And he got off the bus and he had this rake on his arm and it had a bunch of sunscreen and he was going to the breach. Well, SBA says, hmm, now you might've looked at him and said, he went to the store and brought that sunscreen and he's gonna go here and sell it on the beach. You know what we see in the federal government in the United States? We saw an entrepreneur. We saw a person who went and brought a supply at a, at a stage cost and took it to the market where the demand is on the beach and sold it at a premium for his services. Now, if that's not entrepreneurial, I don't know what is. So SBA said, well, wait a minute. How do we deal with him? So what we say in our, in our government, we say, he should not have to carry that onto the beach. He should be able to buy a booth on the beach. And he should be able to sell his product on the beach. So our 504 program is for entrepreneurs like him to buy a building or to buy the facility or even to buy the inventory, the sunscreen itself, so that he can sell his product on the beach because we know he already has the entrepreneurial spirit. Now, why is that important to us? Why would the government do that? And why would we think that he is so important? Because we're greedy. Because he becomes a formal business and we, he becomes a part of our tax base and up goes our G GDP. We're not your friends. <laughs> it has to be something in it for us, okay? So, this is why I think Brazil sits in a golden opportunity. If, because if Brazil is talking about inclusion, and if Brazil is serious about African entrepreneurs, you have 70% more than we do by population and if we can see that guy you know i was driving and the, the the victor who is from the u.s consular and he sees the guy off the bus and he says oh i know what he's doing i said victor you you see something totally different than i see if i was at home in chicago if i was in home in dc as a member of sba i would have stopped the car I would have gave that man my card and I would have forced him to call me 
I would have put him in my counseling training programs, you know, that you heard me say. I would have put him right here in, in our small business development centers. And I would have said, teach him the business acronyms. Teach him. We don't have to teach him entrepreneurship. It's in his blood. It is who he is. Teach him how to cost out his product. Teach him how to price out his product. Teach him how to make the difference and create the revenue stream. Let him know if he needs to expand. Maybe he only has this portion of the beach. How do you know he's not going to have this portion of the beach tomorrow because of what we taught him? And how do we know that he's not going to bring a couple of his friends along and cover other beaches and become a franchise and grow? You have to think about that. And it is in the blood of the entrepreneurs in the African American community, and it is in the blood of the African Brazilians to do so. I saw it too many times. So let me give you what we have done. I gave you an example of what I said, but look at the numbers and look at how we are reaching out. 40% of our loans last year went to women. 75% to African Americans and 50% to Latinos. Guess what? Look at the bottom number. Look at the default rate. Why do you think that is? It is because of what the professor said. Because these communities know that they are discriminated against. Because these communities know that they don't have access to capital. Because these communities know that when you do give them this, that you're giving them an opportunity that is golden, they are far less likely to default on that loan than anybody. Everybody thought we were crazy and we were sitting back going, oh, we're gonna be rich. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, this is what happened. We have less than 2% default rate on our loans to these minority communities. I don't know if I have it here, but let me, let me tell you what that 2% is on. That 2% is on 28 billion US dollars. We're not talking a drop in the butt. We are talking a great percentage of our GDP in the United States. So in a, that's the loan part. That's working with the 7,500 banks. That's capital through the banking system that the professor so outlined. And you, I don't have to go over all my speech because you did a very good job and thank you. So. What happens when they're not bankable? Let's, what happens when they're starting a business? What happens when they're starting a business with an enterprise that doesn't have a track history or something to evaluate the rate of return or to, to something new, some technology, something that can't be gauged by the underwriting department of a bank? Does the federal government not open public policy to that? Does the federal government ignore that arm? Absolutely not. SBA established what we call the small business investment companies. And these are private companies that SBA has worked with that we match their investments. If they put $1 in, we put $1 in and we do this up to $50 million in U.S. dollars to make sure that they can make a loan. 
we in this case two two dollars to their one dollar to three dollars and they go out and make loans to small businesses and why we do this is because we are reducing the risk to the investors on two folds because of the dollars and and the money that is being put in but SBA does not participate in the profit so because we do not participate in the profit it is more likely that our investors are willing to go to communities that they would not otherwise look at professor because now they have US dollars and public policy is set to make them look at that percentage because I I hope I have it here um, we make sure that this multi-million dollar um, program gap is between between entrepreneurs that are general and entrepreneurs in traditional financing and entrepreneurs that are new and open and we make sure that that four billion dollars per year that we authorize 28 23 um billion of assets and under management through almost 300 small business investment course are done that we say 50% of that has to be new. 25% of that has to be minority. And if not, you don't get our funds. So we are forcing the community to do it. We're not, we don't think they're going to go willy nilly and we don't accept, accept them to go because we believe as the professor lined out there, there is an inherited prejudice, and the only way you're going to get above and beyond that inherited prejudice is through public policy. Okay. So, SBA takes all of this and we put it in a capsule of how we look at the entrepreneur. We look at research and development. We look at is it high growth? What financing do they need? What capital do they need? Is it technology driven? Is it private sector? We take everything we can and we look at every possible possibility and we create this environment. But we go one step further. Of those 300 small business investment cores, we created what we call linked and the matchmaking. We went on, we got technology in our blood too, because we're lending to all these high tech people. So we forced them to make us a product, right? And the product they made us is a match. So if our small businesses go to our website, they could put in their requirements and they could put in what they're looking for and they could put in the industry and what they're doing and how they're doing it. And we can match them up with people who we know through our 300 that makes those kinds of deals or works in that kind of industry or does that kind of transaction. And if it's not an equity injection uh, investment, we go back to the 7,500 loans, the banks, and we do the same. And then we look to see who's doing what. So we monitor it. We look to see, are you taking the full faith and credit of the federal government, which is to reduce and to open and, and expand credit to underserved communities, and are you effectively doing it? And if you are not, then we take our credit back, okay? So this is a very, very strong um, position to take. Now, you would say, that's interesting. Now, let me tell you why it's important to SBA. Look at these companies. You are looking at companies that started sitting in a room with loans from SBA who are now far too big to get a loan from SBA, who are 
active participants in our GDP and large companies, AOL, Nike, Apple Computers, Costco's, Jenny Craig, yeah, Staples. All these people started with SBA, started with small loans, started with small investments, started with SBA's pool of products and services to make sure that they work. Why do I point this out? Because let's go back to the guy off the bus. When he opens that franchise, when he takes over all the beaches of Brazil, and he's contracting that franchise out, he's going to be up here. And that's how, why you want to grab him then. Because when he's here, he is not going to be interested in you. You want, you want to go into the Afro-Brazilian community and you want to search them out. We, you know, the professor said, we are timid. We are not going to come to government. We're not going to come to finance. We're not going to come into environments where we know we need access to the capital. And we're not going to do that. I think he said it was 23% that would not come, right? Okay. Then that's 23% that you need to go to. And if you think it's a one-way door and you're waiting for them to come to you, you are not going to be profitable. Your country is not going to have growth if you are not reaching out to those people. Just like I said, if I was at home, I would have stopped that bus. I would have got him. And let me tell you, if I didn't and I told that story, my staff would have gotten me. Okay. <laughs> right. We also handle small business disaster. Um, I am going to talk briefly about this. When there's a national disaster in the United States and a small business is affected, we don't just rely on our small biz our business in, in disruption insurance. We, as the, as, as the federal government, will go in and make sure that those businesses are up and running and back in place through our loan products and get them up to running and up to speed fast and quick because we know that, that the longer they're out of business, the more likely they are not to return and the loss of jobs will be longer. So job retention is very important during the disaster area. It, it, it permeates an increase in the uh, recovery of a, of a uh, community, and it is very important that you step in to help those small businesses, particularly those small businesses that don't have a lot of collateral um, in, the, in the sake of, of a national disaster. Now, we look at communities that are disadvantaged. We not only look at minority communities, we look at low-income communities. We look at communities where enterprise has not taken seats. And we say, we're going to go in there and we want to develop that community. Why would the government want to do that? And it, it goes back to what we talked about is the mission of SBA, to create jobs. If we are the federal government, we're not going to hire everybody. We're, we're, we're not going to create the jobs. The job creators are the small businesses. If there is an area that doesn't have a grocery store or doesn't have the cleaners or doesn't have the baker or doesn't have whatever, I got 10 minutes, oh, God, she Okay, so... I'm going to skip this. We go in and we create the business and we give them loans. I want to get to this because the professor talked about this. This is something that I think is absolutely critical. And based on what the professor was talking about when we talk about Afri 
African descendants of, and entrepreneurs. We want to talk about a program that is key to them. Because I was talking about SBA's programs in the five million U.S. dollars that our 7A goes up to and the $30 million the 504 go up to in our investment pools. But the, the minority entrepreneur needs far less. And so what SBA did is said, okay, Mr. Bank that is inherently prejudiced and have stereotypes within your system and underwriting department, we're going to ignore you. We're going to create an entity all together. And we're going to go into NGOs. And we're going to create a financial institute within that NGO that's catered to that community that will make loans. And we will give them money to make up to $50,000 loans to small businesses because those businesses on average only need about $17.8,000. And so we create from SBA these lenders who make loans to the business. The business in turn repays the loan back to the lenders and then the lenders make loans to more businesses and more businesses. And what FBA does is we monitor, oh. <laughs> yeah, we monitor. So the, the SBA makes the loans to, the, to, the, to these lenders we just created. And we, they make loans to the business. The business repays the loan. It increases the pool of money that is being lent. We make more businesses we reach more businesses, we continue to do that, and SBA keeps repunishing it until the point in which we have succeeded in a community of making sure loans are made. And here is, is how our microloan program work. These, these, we will give the money to these entities up to $750,000 to make the loans. And at some point when it continues and continues, they can go up to a five million dollars for a particular community. And those loans are longer in mature maturity for those people in those areas. Bank loans usually go about seven years. Ours go 10 years because we want them to have a real um, schedule for repayability. We don't want them to be over leveraged. We don't want them to be unable to pay the loan. We want to make it, make sure that we make the loans less. And we make sure that these entities that we have created outside of the banks are restricted on their interest rate. We will not let them become the predator lenders. We restrict their, I got five, okay. We restrict their ability to charge interest because we're giving you this money, it ain't your money in the first place. So we are going to limit how much you can charge on interest. So if the interest, if it's over $10,000, the loan they make, the interest is 1.5%. If it's less than 10,000 because of the thing, we can go up to 2% 2, 2 of the loan. Now, we, because this is a microloan, because this is the government funding this, and because it is, we don't require collateral. So that guy getting off the bus doesn't need to tell me that he has no house to put up for collateral. He doesn't tell me that he has to, to put up anything for collateral because guess what? We're going to buy the whole shelf of of sunscreen for him and say, no collateral, go sell, make the profit and pay us back. And that's how we do this. And this is, this is what is done here. And, and we make sure that these loans are direct and, and to him and that he has a low interest rate. He's not over leveraged 
and that he has a payment plan that extends longer than the bank's duration so that he can get up and on his feet. Now, once he has done this, this is the wonderful thing about what we've done with our microloan program is that even though that $50,000 loan that he made, if he is successful and he repays that loan on a timely basis and he's consistent for six months and a day more, he is eligible for any loan under SBA up to $5 million. We have now made him bankable. We, so not only have we lent him money, we have dealt with the inherited prejudice of the underwriting. We have given the, the guarantee and the sole source of backing of the federal government. We have now made this entrepreneur an enterprise that no bank will most likely reject because he has a guarantee of up to $5 million standing behind him. Think about that. That is, that is true public policy. So this is what we have done. I'm wrapping up because I, I thought I had more time, um, but we are hour off. But we have in our microloan entries, we have over 150 microloan programs. They're targeted in minority communities, particularly African-American communities. We have put over um, $450 million into our um, program. And as you can see, which I wanted to get to, we have created in our more minority community over 86,000 jobs. That's what we have done with this micro loan program based on like kind research that the professor did, acknowledging the inherited prejudice within the financial and underwriting processes of the lending institution and creating public policy to meet the needs of the underserved community in our community. I highly recommend that Brazil takes on a microloan program like the United States. I can tell you in emerging markets across the world, they are looking at our microloan program and they are putting them in place. They are putting them in place in Europe. They are putting them in place in the Middle East. They are putting them in place in Africa. They, they know that this works. And remember what I said, with this number, we are looking at less than 2% default rate. Tell me this is not a viable community to reach. It is, because let me give you, let me give you the number. Yeah. Okay. I had more statistics. I was going to break it down by race. I have five minutes, but I want to show you. I want to say this, and let me say this, and I, will, I promise to shut up. Okay. So what you see here is with that 86,000 jobs, the United States Small Business Administration is proud to say that we have increased the disposable income meaning bringing African Americans to low income to medium income in that number by 28%. So this works. Please reach me out to me, sba.gov, and I will tell you more. Okay? Okay. Muito obrigado, Eugene. Thank you. I'm sorry for hurrying you up. It's just that we want to keep track on time. So I would like to quickly invite Maria Rita Spina, who is the executive director from Anjos do Brasil Institute, which is a great partner of ours. Please, Maria Rita, take the stage. The mic is yours.
Eu vou mudar para o inglês, que eu acho que é melhor para ele. Tudo bem para todo mundo? Muito bem, muito obrigada, Lena, Luana, e todo mundo. I just pelo... love your speech, and this is very hard for me to say. And also, you make my job here very easy and very difficult at the same time. <laughs> yeah, because the first time that I, I was preparing for our first conversation, and I looked in your website, and I saw so many programs, and I said, he won't be crazy and say about it all, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> But that's okay. Since you did that, I will do, and I just have 10 minutes, I will do the just two things here. Okay. The first one, I will ask you a question, at the end, at the end I will try to, to explain, to, to share with you all what I think that we can use here in Brazil about what you said and what I think is very incredible about that. This is what Luana asked me to do. So uh, I want just, uh, and this is my personal bias, I'm very into innovation. I want uh, to understand that. And you said but a lot of things, and I will just focus on that. Because you said two things. The first one is about the guy on the beach selling the sunscreens. That he will, he, he will start with one beach and then go to all Brazil. Great. And the second thing that you put that make me think the list of the big companies that you start with your loans, with your help. So bringing this together with the idea that disadvantaged people has different problems and need different solutions, I want you to explain to us how all these programs will help these people to come from a very small business that create one job, two jobs, three jobs, and I'm sorry to say I don't believe this kind of the jobs is the jobs of the future. We have the, to change the way right. that we are bringing new jobs for the new generations. What we do today is not <laughs> what they can do in 10 years or right. 5 years or 20 years. So how you can help them through all these programs to become more innovative, to find new solutions for their problems, to find new answers because we don't need just uh, to do business as usual. We need new mm. things. So no, if you can I, explain. I, 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 is this on? Yeah. OK. So I will tell you what we do. Through, through our small business development centers, we link those centers to universities. And we have them in every state of the United States, all 50 states. And we have counselors that we bring in graduate students from the business schools from the STEM programs, from the science, technology, engineering, and math. And we train, we counsel and train each of those people. We create what we call emerging leaders program, where we take the entrepreneur, we take the guy from the beach, and we say, this is only gonna last so far because you're going to be up against robotics in five years and there are going to be machines on the beach that are going to be doing what you're going to do how are you going to transform this business from going to the beach to doing something else with the robotics so we do take that to the next step you guys didn't give me enough time i would have another day i i, I I will tell I will you. complain now so yeah, because no, I want I, to hear about but, that. Uh, but I, yes, I know. But, but no, we do. We, we not only create our small businesses, we look at exit strategies for our small businesses. What if our small business wants to sell out? Like I said, he may um, create a franchise and he may, we teach him how to do that franchise. But we also teach him when the life cycle of his business ends how do you cash out? How do you transition out? That is a key to success. How do you deal with, mo with technology that is now a, comp a, a competition to what you're doing and has created a life cycle that has ended your product life? That's a part of what our small business development centers do, and that is free. And we, because it's hooked to our universities, it is with that innovation, it is with that technology, it is with that new research and development, and so we, we put it there. We don't think that we as the government can do that, we don't have the role to do that, so we fund these centers to do that and they are required to do it. And do you think when you connect them to the universities, you need some kind of translation? Because one of the things that I feel the most, and when we talk to the people on the Innova program that Luana made here in Brazil, is that they are 
key to learn. They want to learn and they learn really, really fast. But sometimes when I try to explain to them something, I have to find a different way of saying what I usually say because they have a different context. Uh, and yes and no, and I'll tell you why. There is a level in which we can teach them. <laughs> okay. I think he's, he's saying that he, he have to do the translation also. Oh. When, when he talks to people, okay. No? Ah, he agrees with you, not with me. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when we train, we have to understand that we have to speak their language. There is not a coincidence that I said when we create these development centers in the university, we use students that we use not only professors, we use students, we use people who are learning at that level with them, and we transcend that connection and that communication, because that student is closer to that person, and he or she may be able to explain it in a different way than even the professor can do. And, and it, that, is, that is intentional on our part, mm -hmm. and so we know that translation is important. Oh, very nice to know. And just to finish my questions, and then I do some, some summarization. Uh, would, do you have any kind of uh, history to share with uh, something to make this concrete? For example, a case that an entrepreneur that started early with you and that passed through, what are the programs that they, he or she passed through and then they have some interesting story to share with us? I love histories, I love concrete cases. I think it's easier for us to understand. So give me, I... I want some, uh, some case, some case of an entrepreneur that uh, started with you and that passed through all the, the programs that you have and you can share with us. If you don't well, have, that's okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do have. Um, do y there is a magazine within the United States called Black Enterprise. And Black Enterprise is the leading um, African-American magazine across the United States. And it started with a $50,000 loan, a microloan from SBA. And he was an excellent writer and, and knew how to edit and do all that, but didn't have the ec um, business acumen for marketing and reaching out to the underserved community and, and making sure that he priced the magazine in a way that African Americans could afford to buy his magazine on a monthly basis. And he went through our centers to develop that and, and, and he is our key testament of what our programs can do and what they are now. And now he's a multi-billionaire in the United States. Great, and I, I hope he's also investing in your companies as an he angel. Actually, <laughs> he, he, actually this he is does. my side. <laughs> this is my side. I actually, all entrepreneur, all entrepreneur that has success has yes. to invest back. <laughs> yes, a actually, he does. We also have Mrs. Phil's Cookies. Um, it's a little cookie uh, company that started in Chicago, and it is now worldwide. And uh, Mrs. Phil is the international example of marketing and outreach and going through our counseling and, and uh, technical assistance programs for expanding beyond the United States market for her product and services. So we're very, we're very happy. I, get, I got a ton of them. How many of you got on Nike shoes? Nike started with SBA. <laughs> yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful to know all that. I will try just now to, yeah, I have one minute. <laughs> I will try just okay. to, <laughs> to <laughs> have <laughs> up. I will try to summarize some of your ideas that I think we can use a lot mm -hmm. in Brazil and you help me if I forget something okay. or if I some say something wrong. Okay. One of the things that I, I understand it's really important is to have it all integrated. You said you have capital, you have counseling, you help them when things go wrong. So just to have one action maybe is not sufficient for us to try to solve the problem, to try to help people to create good jobs. It has to be holistic, mm -hmm. it has to be. The other thing that it's very important is that it takes time. You said nine years working with a company. If you just do once or twice, maybe we don't have the results that we want, 
And th this is really, really important because especially here in Brazil, I see from the government many times that they do one program and they just uh, stop it and say, no, it didn't work. And I yeah. say, it's well, not enough time. And absolutely, if you teach someone to swim and then you throw them in the ocean, really? <laughs> I think you need to make sure that they have a lifeboat. You need to know that they know have a navigation system back to shore. And you have to do more than just teach them to swim. So no, you can't do one or two stops. You have to be in there for the long run. Perfect. The other thing that you said uh, that I think is very important is that when you take care of capital, you have also to take care of risk. You cannot just think, go to the banks or go to the investors, the private investors, and say, wow, this is good, this is great. But if they just uh, feel that this is more risky, they will not invest. So it's a role for the government to help to low the risk for the private investors, at least in this beginning. It, it is, it is for two reasons. It, it, to lower the risk because you want to create investments and you want to encourage business support. So to say to your investors you want them to take 100% risk, I think is ridiculous. Um, that is not fair but it's also good for the public good. For the social ills, if you want to create jobs which will reduce crime, which will expand education, which will expose to international markets, which will develop your GDP and deal with a lot of your social ills that come with high unemployment and low income, you must invest some guarantee to create an environment that takes away from the inherited prejudices, the stereotypes, and the limitations that we have in our minds and, and in bladed in our, our underwriting departments that you heard very clearly defined in the, pres in the professor's um, study. You must do that. If you don't, you're wasting your time. I would love to stay one hour more here, mm -hmm. but I can't, and we saying that's enough. I will just say one thing to finish, and one last sentence. You said government are greedy. I think government entrepreneurs and investors are greedy, but this is not a problem and if we do this in a very intelligent way, and this is what I think you are doing in yeah. a very intelligent we'll way. We'll be profitable. We'll make a lot of money. Yeah. We're very happy. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Muito obrigado, Eudine e, e Maria Rita. Desculpe a, a pressão, mas é que o tempo não para. É, como diz o Roberto... Time is of the essence, right? And we have to move on with our event. So we're going to have a very short break. It's going to be a 10-minute break. So you can stretch. And we'll be back with panel number three. Thank you very much for all the presentations. Thank you, Eugene, for your talk, and we'll be right back. Thank you. So, aí, aproveitem também esse intervalo para tomar uma água, dar uma volta na cozinha para aqueles que são fumantes é, apreciar um cigarro. É, e exatamente às 11:50 retornaremos com o terceiro painel. Muito obrigado.
E aí, Selma? Tudo jóia? Tudo jóia? Thank you. 
Golfing. Chile. Then I can control. Okay. I can. That way, I have to go to the engine again. <laughs> the translation. Okay. Now. <laughs> 